Now what I've got up here is focusing on the A in copmia. Now copmia stands for, I don't know if there's any Australian people in our audience. Um, you may be familiar with this um, from back home. It stands for children of uh, parents with mental health um, uh, issues and we in New Zealand added the A which um, refers to the addiction component um, but since putting this all together we've actually renamed um, this uh, implementation process which is now called supporting parents healthy children so our new acronym is SPHC in a nutshell, if I were to just describe a little bit about what this intention is, is that it is about identifying and addressing the needs of children of parents with mental health and or addiction issues. And it is to ensure that parents within our addiction and mental health services are identified and that processes are in place to support them and their children. So it's about seeing our clients as parents um, in the treatment process. So just to let you know, that these are the players in, involved in this uh, implementation, implementation process. There's lots of workforce centres involved. Our Weary Centre represents child and adolescent mental health. Matuaraki represents our addiction workforce, primarily alcohol and drug. Tapo represents our mental health field. Tiro Matatini represents um, Maori development, Lava um, Pacific development and Abacus focuses on the problem gambling sector and I guess today is our um, really a formalized introduction to this concept and how we can bring this implementation process to our problem gambling sector. So involving and valuing children, family and whanau, it's our responsibility. That's, that's our way forward with this implementation. So to just try and set the scene, we, we don't have an awful lot of specific data, but we have lots of information that gathers an impression of what's going on for us in the field. So if we just look at some prevalence figures, this is from Australia. Um, it suggested that 0.6 children per person exist um, with a gambling, uh, with a person with a gambling problem. And if we put that in calculation with estimates that we've got from our health surveys, um, in 2006, 7, and 12, the calculation conservatively might come out to approximately 32,400 children in New Zealand living with a problem gambler, gambler, potentially at the risk of a variety of negative effects. From an international um, uh, research, uh, we can suggest that 50 to 70 percent of people experiencing mental illness are parents. Um, parental problem gambling, substance use, 10 to 13 percent of children might be represented. This is an Australian figure. But in New Zealand, we know that 15 to 30 percent of all children have at least one parent with a mental illness. And 21 percent of a New Zealand sample of parents met the criteria um, of some kind within the DSM diagnosis structure. To kind of localize some of our research, New Zealand children's teams that are represented in, in the likes of Fungare uh, team services, they have gleaned that approximately 70% of families that are referred have substance use is issues. Um, from another study within New Zealand in a general population sample of, of about 7,000 women who gave birth between 2009 and 2010, 16% identified with depressive features and 10% experience panic um, attacks. So I guess what we're coming to is that New Zealand does not currently have any data about the number of parents who are presenting to mental health, alcohol and drug, or problem gambling services. So this is really kind of our, our way into changing that. It's really important to note that having mental health and addiction related problems is not incompatible with being a good parent but can affect parenting ability. So if we kind of, you know, many in the room will already understand some of the, the features of a gambling addiction, but it's just again putting it in the context of how it affects the family. Studies have, have shown that um, certainly family are, are managing uh, with great deal of difficulty around financial issues, emotional and psychological problems and abuse, relationship <coughs> problems that are related to partners but parent-child relationships, and a negative impact on the psychological development of children. 
we know that at least five to ten people um, are affected when problem gambling uh, is in the home. There is a growing concern that children may be more adversely affected, especially as more women are developing gambling problems. Um, and in this study, I know it's a bit dated, but it um, was referring to specifically around the pokey machines. One in six New Zealanders say a family member has gone without something uh, that they needed, whether a bill hasn't been paid due to gambling. Um, and we know that these statistics are even higher from a cultural point of view and a, and a lower socioeconomic point of view. So neglect is, is highly evident, at least, um, and potentially abuse. So my, my <coughs> colleague Sean Sullivan spoke this morning about the dynamics of, of family violence and looking at it within the context of problem gambling. And I think we can glean from that um, research um, to kind of give further evidence of the buy-in that we need to have for, for this incentive. Domestic violence as a coexisting condition to problem gambling offers insight into the potential impact on the children. Some research has indicated that children may be subjected to displace violence from both the gambler and the non-problem gambler. Childhood maltreatment is prevalent in problem gamblers, especially female gamblers. So it's about breaking that cycle. We can almost crystal ball what will happen next if, if we're not doing something. The addition of substance abuse and mental health disorders only um, exacerbate the risk of violence. And just to sum up from a Canadian study in 2010, little attention has been given to prevention of gambling problems as a factor in reducing child abuse and IPV or intimate partner violence. But these data suggest that the link between the two should be considered. And just finally for me, um, just again getting our heads around what are the things that children are being impacted, with, what are the consequences that they're experiencing from the problem gambling. Many um, feel un unloved, loss, uh, losing trust in their parents, not having their essential needs met and finding it difficult even to concentrate in school. They themselves can develop alcohol and drug problems, um, be exposed to anxiety, depression and eating disorder issues, trouble sleeping. Um, it even can affect asthma, allergies, gastrointestinal uh, issues and again, unfortunately, um, the, the risk of their own gambling problems in later life. Okay, I'll hand it over to Joanna. Kia ora koutou. Thanks, Marianne. So I'm Anna Nelson. I'm from Matauraki. We're the Addiction Workforce Development Program, and I'm going to cover off the next part of the presentation. Really, um, Marianne's talked about some of the prevalence figures and some of the less... Uh, nice things that can happen as a, re as a result of addiction, including problem gambling and mental health for our children. But on the positive side, we do know that if we intervene early with children and young people, that we can make a difference and that the, their own mental illnesses can be reduced by up to 40% um, if we intervene early, which is great news and which is what this project that we've been working on collaboratively is about. So we've done a lot of work around um, what it is that needs to change, primarily in our adult services. Our adult services are the ones seeing the parents. They need to be asking about their children. These voices are mostly my own children and some um, my colleagues' children, and they are, they are going to tell us what this literature says from um, interviews with children about what they want in regards to their parents' problematic gambling or alcohol and drug or mental health issues. together wherever possible, support the children in visiting their parents and ensure links are made of support that will help their parents to parent so the family can remain together. Children believe that being in a family involves parents and children loving one another no matter what. This love is expected to be unquestioned and unconditional. Focus on family strengths. Children do not know where to go to get formal help and really seek help with professionals initially. 
Young people wanted, wanted to continue to love their parents, and over time, many of them found ways to do so. This involved understanding more about the na nature of being addicted to a substance that wasn't necessarily about choosing drugs or alcohol over them. Talk to me. Talk to me. Children worry about their parents more than may be recognised, particularly if they fear for their parents' safety. Provide reassurance that removes any fears of blame in the children. Experience of contact with professionals is mixed. Children's concerns include professionals not believing them, not talking directly to them, and not acting to help them when asked. Children's most persistent plea is for more age-appropriate information to help them understand what is going on in their family. Don't assume that abuse or neglect is happening. Don't assume that it isn't. Find a space to talk with the child and, and provide support. Children think their parents should talk to them about alcohol and drug use and not hide it from them. Children are often more aware of problems than parents realise. But they don't always understand what is happening and why. Children say they want someone to talk to who they trust, who, who will listen to them and provide reassurance and confidentiality. Tell me what's going on. I love that. That's my son. Tell me what's going on. So there's some really clear messages around, you might think children don't know what's going on, but they do, that you need to talk to them in an age-appropriate way about helping understand what's going on and make sure that there's no blame attached so it's not their fault. Some really clear messages um, from the children. What parents want is to be asked about their families and whānau. What's the most important the relationship they have? It isn't with you as a clinician. It isn't necessarily with their GP. It's actually with their whānau and their children. And it's sometimes we forget to ask about that most important relationship in their lives. They want to be offered knowledge of positive community supports and to be supported to talk to their children in an appropriate way to explain what's going on. Um, they want to know it's safe to talk about their children and there's a whole lot of ways in which you can make sure that conversation is safe and they want to be supported to attend to the practicalities like transport and roof over the head and food in the children's stomach as well as some um, CBT or whatever to help with their problem gambling. You know, Some of the practicalities that will allow them to get better need to be worked with. So... This has been an ongoing three-year, um, at least, project in developing the guidelines which are relevant to the problem gambling sector. They are a Ministry of Health guidelines that outline some responsibilities and expectations for mental health and addiction services, primarily adult services, when working with children and families. And we have enough for a copy each up here. So that's called Supporting Parents Healthy Children, um, a guideline for mental health and addiction services. And just a brief um, overview of what the guidelines are about. They're about supporting and promoting positive family relationships and the social and emotional development of all children whose parents may have mental health and addiction issues. The vision is about a sector that's family and whānau focused, that takes responsibility for promoting and protecting the well-being of children and makes the rights and the needs of children a core focus of what they do. It employs a strengths-based approach um, to strengthen parenting capability and building resilience for children, and it's about providing evidence-based interventions. Um, it's also about providing services that are culturally safe and appropriate for all our families and whānau. 
and it's about us as clinicians being able to um, uh, um, connect family and whānau with community services. And our role as workforce development centres is making sure that we have a competent and safe workforce that is really able to pull off the expectations in this guideline. And luckily, <coughs> we do have, a, it is a five-year plan, so we do have some time. But it is about systemic change. It is about doing things differently um, for many of us. Many of us actually already do this probably quite well, but generally speaking, it's systemic change. And in addiction and mental health services, we have got new service specs which expect um, um, services or uh, will be paid to um, you know, make sure they meet the requirements in these guidelines. We expect a bit to see DHBs talking about how they're going to meet the expectations in the guidelines. We're lucky enough in mental health and AOD services to have two or three, I think, new primed T codes. So that's the way mental health and addiction collect all their data about who they're seeing and what they're doing. And we've got some special new codes to collect this information. Unfortunately, at this stage, we, we don't think CLIC is near being able to do that, but that is something that we'll continue to work on because we need the data to know how big the problem is. Um, and this is our guideline for services. So we've got a phased implementation process and the workforce development centres are um, funded and contracted to provide support to services to meet the requirements. So we've got two phases. Phase one is essential elements that should be met within three years and phase two is best practice elements. And these elements are at both oh, so at organisational service and practice level. So some examples, I might, should we give them out now? Sure. Because on page, I don't know, on page, I have to find it, <laughs> 28, sorry, uh, is a really good overview of the expectations in the guideline. Uh, and this is pretty much what it looks like. So you'll see we've got organisation level elements, service level elements, and best practice elements. So we're clearly saying that this is about systemic change. We're not just expecting practitioners to do things differently. We're expecting organisations and services to support their practitioners to do things differently. So just as an example, from directly from the guidelines... Phase one, so that's by 2018, at an organisational level, there should be family and whānau focused implementation plans in place. In phase two, family and whānau focused practice KPIs in place. So the KPI um, teams are working on particular KPIs in this area and that is something that should be in place by 2020. At a service level, an example is for phase one by 2016 that a COPMIA champion is in place to support leadership training, support and advice. And we'd really love to see that in, um, in gambling, problem gambling services as well. And again, it's the workforce development centre's role to support those COPMIA champions in those roles. They're going to be really, really important and pivotal. In phase two... Um, that written pathways for support and treatment are available. At a practice level example, phase one, and probably this is not not going to be rocket science for most of you <laughs> in gambling services, but conversations about children, parenting, family and whānau are routine. And many people say that they think that's already happening across mental health and addiction and I, I'm just not convinced. So there we go, we've got till 2018 to make that regular routine practice. And then phase two, by 2020, we're looking at family and whānau focused practice being embedded in all aspects of service delivery. So for many but not for all, it's quite a change to maybe how we've been doing things with that very individual focus, that very individual lens. So 
we're going to be doing a lot of the workforce de development to make sure you guys are ready for this. Some of the training that we'll be offering, um, family inclusive practice, single session family consultations, child care and protection training. We've actually got the Vulnerable Children's Act, which is the legislation that supports this work. It must be done because um, we have a piece of legislation that says it's our responsibility. Um, supervision and then lots of, there's lots of ideas around e-learning resources. So we're going to be quite busy, I think. <laughs> Um, we also need to provide organisational level um, workforce development support and we're looking into a variety of um, um, implementation strategies, for example the Beacon strategy. Um, we've also working with our colleagues at Te Matatini, um, really starting to look at and unpick how this fits with whānau water and how and, and whānau ora challenges um, some of the assumptions around kotmia, which is sometimes fully focused on the child rather than the whānau. So that's why we've moved away from the kotmia acronym um, to try and make sure we know we're talking about family inclusive practice here, not just working with children, because I think you can't do one without the other. And... That's a poster that you can have up, that you can get from Matawaraki. But what I'm going to do now is hand back over to um, Mary Ann, who's going to just give you a case study of what we'd like to see as a result of these guidelines. Okay, I'll just read through a scenario. It's just to kind of put a picture, really. Um, to this information and um, hopefully it is representative of um, what um, isn't far off from being realistic within our problem gambling sector and the intervention services. So we've just picked someone named Jill. Um, she's a 33-year-old mother of three uh, whose youngest is 18 months and, and the oldest is six. And she's been referred to the community-based problem gambling service for an appointment by her GP. Jill is phoned by a person from the service and invited to suggest appointment times that suit her and her whānau. Again, key that it's for her and her whānau. Um, the appointment can occur at home, which I think our sector does very well and can accommodate that potential, or anywhere suitable to Jill and her whānau. The person on the phone asks Jill who is in her whānau as part of the phone conversation. She has also asked her ethnicity and if there are other people she would like involved in the contact with the service. If we again make that just a consistent you know, way of engaging with new people to the service, then um, you know, a new culture emerges really within that, that service provision. Jill decides to come into the service. She brings her 18-month-old and her three-year-old child. Her pa partner isn't, is working, so is unable to attend. And she arrives along with her children. All are, are welcomed warmly. She and her children are shown to a whānau room with a kitchenette with fruit, snacks, drinks. The room has bean bags, toys, games, and comfortable chairs, and family posters on the wall, like Anna highlighted. Jill and her children are introduced to the practitioner for the appointment, and the practitioner checks if there is anything Jill needs for her children. Jill is offered that the children may stay in the Fano room or come with them and to um, meet with the practitioner in, in that, that particular office. And the practitioner's office is equally well equipped for Jill and her family. Um, the practitioner engages Jill in conversation about the reason she's attended. And the practitioner is very clear about what she would need to do if she had any concerns for the children. But she's equally clear that Jill can be, his, um, be a good mother, even if she has issues around her gambling. The practitioner hears what Jill is engaged, um, hears that Jill is engaged with the uh, final support service, and that Jill has let that service know of her appointment today. I guess in emphasizing that need for some transparency across services. And the practitioner is confident talking to Jill about mental health, addictions, as well as family and whānau, parenting, and any concerns she might have about her children. The practitioner is confident in talking to the children in a friendly and welcoming way. And if they were older, she would be able to help them understand um, what mum might be going through in an age-appropriate way. 
Jill feels that it's okay to continue contact with the service and feels able to talk about her children and her partner who um, is able to attend the next session. So again, it's all about Thana. And that's really it. Um, and um, that's for just today anyway, Anna, and my contact details for any more information. So thank you very much. Uh, so the Beacon Implementation Strategy is something that comes out of the Bouverie Centre, which is a family therapy centre in Australia. And it's really, they've used it to implement family inclusive practice in mental, adult mental health and addiction services in Victoria. And it just puts a system around uh, making sure that you're getting a readiness for systems change at each level, organisational service and practitioner level. So it's just a way, and the beacon name comes from the fact that um, you, you really choose a number of services to become beacons. And they're like a leading light that other people can um, ask um, advice from and can role model. Yeah. So we're looking at implementing those here? Well, it's just a, it's a way of really we can roll out as much training and as much of these, but unless the whole system's ready, nothing changes. So it's, a, it's, it's really um, like a strategy to understand how to make things like this work. Yeah. I think in communities, though, if, if people have ideas on how to strengthen that capability, we'd be really looking to you in the community and what's the best way forward that works for that community to create that model. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Marianne.